You know, let me share some things with you. Uh, I was supposed to receive an offering sometime tonight, and I might do it yet. Who knows? But look over here in 1 Peter chapter 5. And some of you may not see the connection right here at first, but if you'll stick with me, this would help you with your healing. In 1 Peter chapter 5, it says in verse 5, it says, Likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Before I get into the rest of this, let me just say that this is something that people don't like. People don't like to submit to other people. Everybody wants to be the lead singer. Everybody wants to be the one who gets all the attention. We don't like submitting to other people. But again, did you know until you come to the end of yourself, you don't really find the beginning of God. Until you get to a place that you, it's not about you and it's not about promoting yourself. You can trust yourself to the Lord. You can give yourself to the Lord. You know, uh, again, we had something happen today and they wanted me to write a response. And I said, just tell them that everything they said is a lie, but don't make a big deal out of it. You don't have to sit here and defend yourself. When you are defending yourself, you know, I had a prophecy. Some of you have heard me give this, but back when Jamie and I were still in the Baptist church, uh, we were preaching things that were contrary to the Baptist doctrine and they were criticizing me and I was trying to defend myself and I was arguing with people and telling them that this is true. And you know, I've just, uh, now I've gotten to a place that it doesn't matter what somebody says about me. It does, I don't care. But back then it was really bothering me. And I went to this meeting and the guy, Joe Nay, who is my mentor, he called me out of a group of two or 300 people. And he gave me a prophecy and he said, I see you like a runner on a track, one of these oval tracks. And he said, you're leading the race, but the people in the grandstands are yelling at you and telling you that you're doing it all wrong. And he said, even if, he says, I see you getting off of the track and going up into the grandstands and arguing with the spectators and trying to justify yourself. And he says, even if you win the argument, you're gonna lose the race. He says, just stay on track. Don't get into the grandstands. And you know, here I am 50 something years later and this is still one of the dominant things that God has put in my life is not to defend myself. And this is counter to the way that we're built naturally. We all come into this world totally self-centered thinking about ourselves, And we have this thing that if I don't promote myself, who will? I've got to defend myself. This person has said something wrong about me. Let me just suggest to you that you know what that is? That is self-centered, that's pride, that is promotion of self. And I know that this goes contrary. There's probably, I would say, even the majority of people here. You're the cream of the crop. You've come to a conference. And man, I'm not ragging on you at all, but I'm just saying that we're all born selfish and very few people ever get out of it. It just is like our default mechanism that, man, I've got to protect myself. Somebody said something about me. But you know, the scripture says in Romans chapter 12, Jesus, uh, it says, vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord, I will repay. Did you know if you'll let God defend you, God will take care of you better than you would take care of yourself. If you defend yourself, you have just exempted yourself from God defending you. He can't defend you if you are defending yourself. I could give you multiple examples of this. I'm not going to take the time to do it right now. I want to read these scriptures. But I've had people go on national television, call me a slick cult. And now today, I, I didn't retaliate at them. I didn't try and justify myself. I even sent them money when they got in trouble. They sent out a letter talking about how bad everything was. And I sent them a big offering to help them. And I've just blessed them. And did you know that one day I was on TBN and I was in the great green room waiting to go on the TBN broadcast and this other minister was there that had called me the slickest cult since Jim Jones. And it was 20 years later. And they just said, oh, I love your ministry. I watch you every day on television. And they just loved us. And they've invited Jamie and me over to stay with them. And we, I've got their phone number right here on my phone. We've had them come minister in this school. They never have apologized. I don't know what happened. <laughs> They're getting older. It may be that they're senile. I don't know, but, <laughs> but we're friends now. 
And you know, we've got a man that lives right here in Woodland Park that used to have people burn my tapes and books and he hated me. And, and I just blessed the guy. I never said anything about him. And we were in a meeting where there was like 700 people and this man, Joan A., who was my mentor, he was the speaker. And every day he'd have me come up and say, Andrew, just have you got something to share? And I'd share for five minutes. And after five days of that, this guy who had told people I was of the devil and had them burn my books, he came up in front of five, 700 people, whatever it was, and he fell down and got to crying and crying on my boots and begged me to please forgive him. And, and I didn't, you know, he just criticized me in front of a few people. And here he was repenting in front of 700 people. God will take care of you better than you'll take care of yourself. And so this is what it's saying, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Did you know the word resist here means to actively fight against? God actively fights against the proud. Now I know that God loves us and that we've been forgiven of all of our sins, past, present, and future. So I don't think that this means that he's, he hates us. I don't think that means he's going to put sickness on you. He's not the one who's punishing you. But his kingdom is set up on humility. Jesus even said this in uh, Matthew chapter 11. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. In heart. This is Jesus speaking, God in flesh speaking and saying, I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your souls. God is a meek God. He set his kingdom up to flow through humility. In the same way that electricity doesn't flow through wood, it flows through copper and through things like that better than it does wood. It's just the laws that God has established. Did you know the power of God flows through humility? There's twice in Isaiah that the Lord, God the Father, was talking about the Messiah coming, and he said, my glory I will not give to another. That was God the Father talking about the Son. And he said, he will not give his glory to another. And what that's saying is that God flows through Jesus. Jesus was meek and lowly in heart. And when you humble yourself and when you submit yourself and you promote God's kingdom more than you promote your kingdom, that's what allows the power of God to flow. And it's just like that law of electricity. It's not that, you know, God hates wood. There's a purpose for wood, but electricity doesn't flow through wood the same way that it flows through copper. The power of God doesn't flow through you when you're all about yourself and when you are promoting yourself and you are living for yourself and you're more important to you, you know, than anybody else is. It actually hinders the flow of God. When you humble yourself is what it says, that he, he resists the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. And then the next verse says, humble yourselves. Therefore, notice it says, humble yourselves. If it's done to you, it's not humility. It's humiliation. When you are broken, when something happens and you're just totally humiliated, when you come to the end of yourself and you say, now, God, I'm just so broken. Well, that's not humility. That's humiliation. You have to humble yourself. This has to be voluntary. You know, we had a friend of mine who was caught in sexual sins and uh, anyway, the church disciplined him and they uh, honestly were very nice to him. They took care of a lot of things, guaranteed him that they'd continue to pay him. They, they paid for him to go through restoration. And anyway, he didn't take any of those things and he rebelled at it. And he went on nationwide television. I think it was Oprah, if I'm not mistaken, and started criticizing the people and saying that Christians are the only ones that kill their own wounded and he blamed everybody else and he said he had humbled himself but what he was he was humiliated because when you're truly humble you won't blame other people for a mess that you caused it's like the prodigal son that's an example of true humility when he finally hit the pig pen and he came to the end of himself 
Then he says, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. And he went back and he didn't demand anything. He didn't demand his father to uh, forgive him. He humbled himself and he says, just make me a hired servant. Just help me do something. See, that's, that's true repentance. But when you get caught in something and then you start pointing the finger and say, well, maybe I did something wrong, but you don't understand. It's because I was raised in a dysfunctional family. It's because I was abused when I was a child. Anytime you start pointing the finger at somebody else, this is that Adam syndrome when God said, why did you do what you do? And he says, it's that woman that you gave me. And he was passing the buck to everybody else. A truly humble person is a person that will just say, I'm wrong. And it doesn't matter if everybody else responded incorrectly to you and if they treated you badly or not. You're the one that gave them the occasion. You don't sit there and criticize somebody else for their negative response to your negative actions, a truly humble person will just humble himself and accept responsibility. This is how you can tell if a person is truly humble. They aren't going to sit there and try and deflect any of the shame, any of the guilt, and blame somebody else for what they've done. Every last one of us was brought up in a dysfunctional family. We all were brought up in a fallen world. Maybe some are worse than others, but the truth is life is a terminal experience. Satan is out to get us and there's just bad things that happen. And if you are going to sit there and blame somebody else for your problems, you will never be a victor. You can't be a victor and a victim at the same time. You have to accept responsibility. Now, you don't need to live there. You need to throw it over on the Lord and receive forgiveness and you can be totally cleansed and you can be so set free from shame that it's like it never happened to you. That's my little definition of the word justified, just as if I'd never sinned. Justified. You can find that through Christ, but you can only find it when you come to the end of yourself. You can only find it when you die to yourself. And whether you recognize it or not, Pride is not dying to yourself. Pride isn't just arrogance, thinking that you're better than everybody else. Pride is just self-focus. If you spell out the word P-R-I-D-E, I is the center of pride. Pride is all about you. And, and this is where Satan gets us. We all have this tendency. We were all born selfish. You didn't care that your mother had been up all night long giving birth. You'd wake everybody in the house up. When you want something, you just cry. You wake everybody up. You can bring a little baby into a service like this, and they don't care that there's hundreds, thousands of people here wanting to hear the word. They'll just cry. They'll, they don't know that anybody else exists. You know what? When you're a week old, that's not so bad. But when you're 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, and you still, it's all about you, and you don't know that anybody exists but you, that's a serious problem. And there are many of us that are still as self-centered as we've ever been. We now are sophisticated, and instead of falling on the floor and sucking your thumb or throwing a fit, you now have sophisticated ways of being selfish. But it's the same thing. This says you have to humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. You know, this may sound like it's opposite of what I'm talking about. But once you humble yourself, did you know God will exalt you? This is where some people that teach on humility go wrong is because they teach that humility is just thinking bad about yourself and having a terrible self-image and you just hate yourself and they call that humility. That's not humility at all. That's a false humility. Humility is just coming to the end of yourself, putting God first, and then God says that if you humble yourself, He's going to exalt you. And if you won't let God exalt you, then that's pride. You're exalting yourself. You know, over in Numbers chapter 12, it says that Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. And if you read it in context, he was, that was spoken about Moses because his brother and sister had come out against him because he had an interracial marriage. He had married an Ethiopian woman who was black. And of course, he was a Jewish complexion. So it was an interracial marriage. And Miriam and Aaron came out and spoke against him and said, you aren't the only one that God speaks through. And then Numbers 12, 3, in parentheses, now the man Moses 
was very meek above all the men which were upon the earth. And do you know who wrote that? Moses. Moses. The Lord inspired him to write that you are the meekest man on the earth. And if he would have said, I can't say it. What would people think about me if I said that? Did you know that would have been pride? Did you know true humility is not uh, exalting yourself above what God says, but it's also not demoting yourself. It's not beating yourself down. It's just coming to the end of yourself to where you humble yourself. And then if God wants to exalt you, if God wants to use you, you will humble yourself. You know, when Jesus came to John the Baptist, John the Baptist says, I'm not even worthy to undo your latchet on your sandals. You're wanting me to baptize you. I have need to be baptized by you. And Jesus said, John, suffice it, uh, suffer it to be so now so that we can fulfill all righteousness. And did you know, if he would have persisted and says, but no, I'm not worthy. I cannot do this. That would have been pride. It was humility for him to humble himself and do what God told him to do. True humility isn't exalting yourself, nor is it debasing yourself. It's just finding yourself in Christ, finding your identity in him and letting him live through you. And if it's to die, as we saw depicted tonight, Man, you love him more than yourself and you would live for him and you would die for him. And if he wants to put you in a position of authority and use you to touch other people, well, you'll do that too, but you'll give all of the glory to him. You aren't going to take it to yourself. It says if you humble yourselves, he will exalt you in due time. And look at this in verse seven. Most people think that this is a completely separate thought and talking about something else. But it's still the same context. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And then verse seven says, casting all of your care upon him because he cares for you. Did you know that that is an act of humility? This is not disconnected. If you are truly humble, you will cast your care over on the Lord. Let me say it this way. If you haven't cast your care over on the Lord, if you are burdened down, if you're overwhelmed with your sickness, with maybe the finances that go along with it, what's going to happen to my family? And if you are just beat down by these things, I'm saying this in love, but I'm trying to help you. You know what that is? That's pride. And God resists the pride. God's power does not flow through pride. One of the best things you can do if you are in a life and death situation is to just go to the Lord and cast your care about it over on the Lord. And say, Father, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm believing for healing. And I believe I am going to get healed because you provided it. But you know what? I just don't care. If I live, I win. If I die, I win. I can't lose for winning. And when you get to a place that you've come to the end of yourself and you're no longer under fear and you're under pressure and you're, you're burdened down with things and stressed out, all of a sudden this supernatural power of God starts flowing through you because God doesn't flow through pride. He resists the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. You know, I ministered to a woman this week and she came in, and it's a long story, but crisis situation with her daughter. And I mean, it looks like her daughter could die and an ex-husband is standing in the way and fighting against everything that's going on. And Daniel and our people here have been ministering to her multiple times, but <laughs> she had a dream. And in this dream, Chuck Norris came up to her and told her to go ask Andrew Womack for prayer. <laughs> That's the first time I'd ever heard that one. <laughs> and anyway, I was trying to minister to her, but every time I'd minister to her, she was just crying and, oh, it's so terrible. And she was just so upset over things. So you know what I finally did? I turned to these verses and I showed her. I said, the power of God will never flow through you. I said, right now, you're the only one in this situation who's trying to believe God. And the power of God can't flow through you because you're so depressed. You're so discouraged. You're so stressed out. And I said, you're the only one believing. And yet 
you, the power won't flow through you as long as you do that. I said, you need to humble yourself and recognize you don't have control over everything that's going and just cast your care about this over on the Lord. Continue to pray and continue to believe that things work, but you've got to get out of this defeat and out of this fear. And you've got to start letting the peace of God flow through you. As uh, Daniel shared, man, your rest is your weapon. You got to get to where you cast your care over on the Lord. And I know that God put this on my heart tonight for all of the people that didn't come to this conference. <laughs> Certainly this couldn't apply to anybody that's here. But there are some of you that have been trying so hard. You know, I've actually told people before when they are just focused on getting a healing and that's all they think about and they are just so focused on it that they can't think of anything else. I've actually told them, you need to forget this. You need to quit praying about your healing. You know, Mike Hesh, this is what really happened to him. He was focused on healing for how long? It was a year too long. <laughs> anyway, are you going to be sharing tomorrow? Yeah, so I'm not going to take away all of his thunder. But Mike Hesh finally just came to a place where he believed he had received and he just started resting. This is what Jeremiah Class was talking about. When he gave his testimony, he had tried so hard to get healed of multiple sclerosis and finally he just came to a place to where he gave up and quit and that's when the power of God fell. I'm telling you that there are some of you that are focused so much on yourself and what you're going through that you, don't, you can't think about anybody else and you are just focused on yourself, I'm telling you that if you are all wrapped up in yourself, you make a very small package. You need to get your attention off of yourself. You know, one of the things that I do when I need something, I'll go find somebody else that needs something and I'll go to giving to them, especially if it's healing. If I need a healing in my body, I love to call out what I'm dealing with and have somebody with that exact same problem and I'll go pray for them and minister to them because when you give, it's given back unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. And it's a way of multiplying the power of God back to myself. Quit thinking about yourself and go think about somebody else and give to somebody else. And I'm telling you, when you do this, it, this, you may think that this is disconnected from healing, but it, this says that God resists the proud. Again, not in a sense that he hates you, but his power can't flow through you when you are all focused on yourself and when you're depressed and stressed out and discouraged. You need to cast your care over on the Lord, knowing that he cares for you. God loves you more than you love you. And if you can't trust God and if you can't rest and say, Father, I'm just content. I believe in healing. I'm not trying to discourage anybody, but you need to get to a place. To, if you didn't get healed, you're still going to love God and you're still going to praise God and you're still going to start worshiping and praising God. We've talked about that this week too, that you need to praise God before, I think that was Carly, I, I forget. But anyway, somebody was talking about that you need to have praise before you see the manifestation. Yeah. A person who only praises God once everything is worked out is because you are focused on yourself and you can't find anything to praise God outside of yourself. You need to look beyond yourself. You need to go to praising God for who he is, regardless of what's going on in your life. Did you know that we've seen so many people heal? We've seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open just today. We've seen great things happen. You know, you should be rejoicing over that. But I can guarantee you there's people in here that when you saw somebody else healed, you thought, why hadn't it happened to me? That's what I needed. That's what I wanted. You know what that is? Pride. Self-centeredness. You can't rejoice with another person for what they've received. All you can think about is, why didn't I get mine? Amen or oh me. If you can't say amen, you can say oh me. But I'm just exposing, see, one of the big problems that God resists pride. God doesn't flow through pride. You need to humble yourself. You need to rejoice with those who rejoice. And when you see somebody else receive, you ought to just be so blessed and thinking about this and glorifying God. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, if we would do this, 
If you would get to a place that it's not about you, you would find the power of God would flow better through you. Somebody says, well, what about my problem? See, there you are, self-centered again. Why don't you forget your problem for a minute and why don't you go to thinking about God and just praise Him? God, you're a good God. Whether I ever see my situation manifest or not, you're a good God. Rejoice in the fact that we just saw a play that glorified the Lord for healing the lepers and the blind and all of these things. And you ought to be praising God over that. You ought to be praising God over these people that have been healed down here. And you need to be praising God for things like that instead of just thinking about yourself. Amen. Amen. It's only when you come to the end of yourself that you will really find the, the beginning of God. We are our biggest problem. Cancer is nothing. All of these other diseases are nothing. It's the things that's inside of us that are even worse than that. And it blocks the supernatural power of God. I tell you, if you can get your heart right and just start worshiping the Lord for who He is whether you've experienced it or not. You know, when I first understood about healing, I had been relatively healthy. I hadn't had any major problems or anything like that. But when I started believing in healing and preaching healing, I was sick for six months. I had a cold. I had the flu. I had something, aches and pains. You know, the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 10 that once you're enlightened, you endure a great fight of afflictions. It's like Satan comes to steal the word and he will take everything he's got planned at you for five years in advance and throw it at you all at one time because you're your weakest when you first receive a truth. And he's going to throw everything he's got seeing if you'll back up. I didn't understand what was happening, but for a while I actually considered about, man, if this is the way it goes when you preach on healing, I'm going to quit preaching on healing. <laughs> For two reasons. I thought, you know, I don't want all of this sickness. And the other thing, I didn't want to be a hypocrite and preach on healing if I couldn't live it. And finally, I just came to a decision that, you know what, it's the truth. And I don't care if I can see it or not. I'm going to preach it because it's the truth. And when I finally got myself off my eyes off of myself and just thinking about myself and went to presenting truth because it was the truth and the truth is what will set people free. Then I started, I got free of all of those things myself. I'm telling you, as long as you're just focused on yourself and you're taking every word that you hear and everything that you're doing and it's all about you and you're just constantly focused on your situation, you're actually making things worse. You need to get to a place to where, man, you just love God and you believe God and it's really immaterial in a sense whether or not you ever get healed. Now that could be misunderstood and misapplied, but I hope you're understanding what I'm trying to say. You know, I heard a story about a woman who had a huge goiter on her neck and she went to a camp meeting and they prayed for her and she believed that she got healed and she heard the truth about that by the stripes of Jesus was healed. And so the next morning she got up in front of the whole camp meeting and said, I was healed. My goiter is healed. And yet that thing was still there. You could still see it. But people understood that, you know, like Jesus cursed the fig tree and it took 24 hours for what had been spoken to come into physical manifestation. And so they kind of gave her some grace and everybody, uh, you know, clapped and thought, well, maybe it's going away. Well, she came back the next year and she still had this huge goiter and she got in front of everybody and she said, it was a year ago tonight that God healed me of my goiter. And everybody thought, this is weird. But they didn't say anything. The next year she came back, two years later, and said, it was two years ago tonight that God healed me of my goiter. And people were beginning to get concerned. So they talked to the leadership and they said, you got to tell this woman that she can't get up and testify that she's healed if it's obvious that she's still got this huge goiter. And so the leadership called her in and said, you can't give this testimony anymore because, you know, we want to be accurate. You're a hypocrite. You're saying that you possess something that you don't have. And anyway, that woman that night, she went to her room and she says, God, I know you healed me. 
And she says, I believe it, but these people can't believe that anything happens until they see it. Would you please take that thing away so that they could believe it? And the next morning she got up and it was totally gone. And she got up and she says, I told you God healed me. Now that's not 100% right. We do need to get it manifest and not just make it a confession. It needs to be something that's true. But the principle is that you need to get so convinced that you're healed that you aren't focused on yourself and you aren't thinking about yourself and you can just lay it aside and you can worship God for who he is and you can rejoice with other people that are being healed and praise God for that. You know, if nothing else, you ought to look like you're, you know, you're standing in line and here's a window that you're trying to get to. And when somebody else in front of you gets healed, at the very least, you ought to say, praise God, that's one less person in line. Amen. I'm closer <laughs> to the front of the line. You ought to be rejoicing with other people. And you can tell whether or not you have truly humbled yourself and whether you are truly putting God and other people first by looking at this, have you cast your care over on the Lord? Are you struggling with this? Can you not sleep at night because you're trying to figure out what you're going to do? If you've got care, that is an evident token that you haven't humbled yourself. Now you may be in process. Maybe it doesn't happen all at once. Maybe it's going to take a brief period of time. But ultimately, when you truly have cast your care over on the Lord... You aren't going to be stressed out. You aren't going to be worried about it. You're going to be able to rejoice. I don't care what's going on in your body. You will be able to praise God. You know, I've got some good friends, Derry and Karen Jolly, that Karen uh, has gone overseas and they minister, have ambassadors to the nations. If you've been to any of my meetings, I have them come often and give testimony. And anyway, Karen, I forget how many years ago, but I know it's been over a decade. It's probably closer to 20 years ago. She got some kind of a bug and it has affected her and she has had terrible pains. And I've spent hours praying with her about it. And I don't know exactly where she is now because she doesn't talk about it. I don't know if she's still dealing with things or not. But I know that for many years, Karen had just terrible pain, but you would never know it. We got a lot of people here that know them. And I guarantee you, Karen Jolly has never, ever missed an opportunity to minister, to go on a trip overseas. She does things. She puts other people first. And I don't know if she's still dealing with it or not because I don't, she never talks about it. But I know that she has gone through a lot of things. And yet, man, she loves God and praises God and she's happy. And there's some people in here that, again, I'm saying this in love, but you are just so focused on yourself that you aren't going to rejoice over anybody. You aren't going to rejoice over anything. You can't praise God for anything until you get your situation fixed. And you are so focused on yourself that you just will not let the power of God flow through you. You couldn't pray for anybody else. That is a huge hindrance to your own healing. You need to learn to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And you need to learn to die to yourself. And just as we saw depicted tonight, man, when you find the joy in the Lord so that whether you live or die, isn't that big of a deal? It's not that big of a deal. Now that isn't to discourage anybody to go out and take your life. That's certainly not what I'm talking about, but I'm saying you need to get to a place to where we love the Lord so much that just as we saw depicted tonight, that man, you love the Lord so much to think about seeing him and be awesome. And I know that there's somebody in here thinking, well, you can preach that, but you can't live that. Did you know I got touched by the Lord March the 23rd, 1968. I fell in love with the Lord. I was a Pharisee trusting in myself and thinking that God owed me something because I, I was living holier than anybody I knew. And that's not a prideful state. I just, I, I didn't know anybody who was living as holy as I was. I'm 75. I've never taken a, uh, a drink of liquor. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never said a word of profanity in all my 75 years. And I was trusting in how good I was. 
And then God showed up and I, show, I saw his mercy and his glory and I saw his holiness. And in comparison to the holiness of God, man, all of my righteousness was like filthy rags. And I honestly thought that God was going to kill me. And so I started confessing everything I had ever done or anything I ever would do. And I spent an hour and a half turning myself inside out in front of the leaders of the church, in front of all of my friends, just confessing what a hypocrite I was. And uh, at the end of that, I didn't know what was going to happen. And I was just laying on the floor. And instead of rejection or punishment, the love of God just overwhelmed me. And for four and a half months, I was caught up in the presence of God. Emotionally, I didn't know very much. It was just an emotional experience. And then the emotion wore off. I got drafted and sent to Vietnam. But did you know what? I had tasted the goodness of God and I loved God so much that I spent 13 months in Vietnam just asking God to take me home. I was ready to go be with the Lord because I figured you couldn't live on that plane that I had tasted I figured you couldn't live there and the only way I could get back there was to just die. And so I honestly spent 13 months asking God to die me and I, uh, kill me. And I nearly died twice in one day. And I found out I wasn't quite as excited about dying as I thought I was. <laughs> and I figured I was going to have to somehow or another make it through Vietnam. And so I just stuck my nose in the book and got to studying. But did you know I was a chaplain's assistant and... Uh, he was a Protestant chaplain, but in a sense, he gave like the last rites to these guys. There was an LZ prep that was so close to the Laotian border that we, up on this mountaintop, we could see the deuce and a half, the NBA driving down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, but it was out of bounds and we couldn't shoot at them. But it was that close to Laos and it was out in the middle of nowhere. And these guys were under attack and it was probable that every one of them was going to die. And so they flew the chaplain out there to have a last service with them before they died. And so I was the chaplain's assistant and I went with him and we were in a place that was smaller than this auditorium. And there was about a hundred guys on this base. And in a couple of hours time that I was there, we took 175 mortars that I counted inside of our perimeter. And people were dying all around us. And you could see the muzzle fire from the weapons coming up the hill. And they were far enough away that I didn't shoot at them, but I had my M16 pointed at them. I was ready to fire and defend myself. But anyway, I saw it, it was that close. And we were in a battle. And what would, you, what would your reaction be? You know what I actually was thinking? I was so excited. I thought, Jesus, this is awesome. I could see you before the day is over today. And I was having the love of God. And I mean, I was excited like, man, this is awesome. I may be in heaven before nightfall. I know some of you think I'm weird, but I think you're weird <laughs> to be all wrapped up in yourself when the truth is that we have these promises that to live is Christ and to die is gain. We have these promises that, man, heaven is going to be a blast so that we never have any more sorrow or pain. We won't even remember the former things. We're going to live in a mansion on streets that are paved with gold and on and on it goes. Did you know we should be to a place that we don't have a fear of death, that we aren't so focused on ourselves that we are just consumed with all of the stuff that's happening to us. And I promise you, if you do that, you'll wind up actually having the power of God flow through you better. You will get healed quicker than if you are sitting there in just desperation and fear and grief trying to deal with these things. We need to be able to praise God beyond what we're feeling, beyond what we see. We need to praise Him for who He is not just all of the things he does. Now, I believe in healing and I, I, I know you came here to be healed and God wants every one of you healed, but he also wants you to get to where you love him, you love other people more than you love yourself. That's the way that he is. He's meek and lowly in heart. And when you get that attitude, 
I guarantee you, it just releases the supernatural power of God. Let me say this one last thing is that you can't do this by yourself. I've often thought of this. It's like if you were standing in a mud puddle or something and if you were trying to clean your feet, did you know you could lift one up and you could get it clean, but then how do you get the other one clean? You'd have to, you can't do this yourself. You have to have somebody lift you out of that thing. You can't die to yourself by yourself. It takes a supernatural encounter with God. With me, it's when I saw my uh, hypocrisy and I saw how religious and what a Pharisee I was. And man, March the 23rd, 1968, I just made a decision that God was more important than me. And I humbled myself. And I can't say that I've done it perfectly, but that's when I made that decision. And you know, now for 56 years, I've been walking in this and the Lord still deals with me over self-centered. Somebody, I've, had, I've taught on this before and I've had people come up and said, would you just please pray with me and cast self out of me? <laughs> the only way I can cast self out of you is to kill you. <laughs> and then you'll never have another problem with self again. But as long as you're in this body, you have the option. God isn't going to force you to do anything. And you have the option to just totally think about yourself and focus on yourself. But you also have the option, according to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, to make yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is just your reasonable service. That's not just for the Christian, for the preacher. That's for every one of us. Jesus died for us and he wants us to live for him. He wants us to be a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. It's not a one-time thing. This is something that you have to live constantly. I made that decision March the 23rd, 1968, but the Lord's still dealing with me and I still have to deal with self. You'll never get over it. But you can get to where you put God and other people and what God has called you to do ahead of yourself. And when you do that, man, it just starts a supernatural flow. And you know, I can truthfully tell you that one of the reasons that God's blessing is on this ministry is because of all of our leadership. I wish you had time to just talk to these people. These people who are here to glorify God. We are here because we believe that God has given us an opportunity to help other people. You know, I mentioned earlier today about Mike and Carrie have been tasked, you know, tapped to take over the ministry. And not long after we told them that, they accepted it and they said, we, you know, they prayed about it and they felt like, yes, that was the Lord. And so we're moving that direction. But they came to Jamie and me and they said, look, if you find somebody else that would do a better job, if you ever change your mind, that's just fine with us. That's amazing. You know what that is? That's a humble attitude. That's putting God and putting somebody else ahead. Right now we have $150 million worth of assets and we are in the process of building another billion dollars worth of stuff and they're inheriting all of this and they said, if you would rather have somebody else, that's great. You know what that is? That's humility. That's putting God first. And yet it would be wrong if they said, well, we aren't worthy and we can't do this. No, that's False pride, that's promoting themselves. They've come up to the level, they've accepted the responsibility, they're letting God promote them, but they aren't promoting themselves. There's a difference between you promoting yourself and letting God be the one that promotes you. And when God promotes you, it would be pride on your part to turn it down. And Billy Epperhart worked for us for a, a year, I'm sure, or more, with no money. Matter of fact, I just found out tonight that when he first came here, I didn't know these things, but they actually towed his car because he parked in the wrong place. And that. <laughs> I didn't know those things until tonight. And here this guy is, that is very successful, got all these businesses. He's coming here to be a blessing. And this is the way my ministry treats him. <laughs> And he worked for us for a year with no money. And finally, my board said, you are going to get paid something. This is wrong for you to be running this ministry and not take a salary. And so he took it. And they gave him a raise last year, but he didn't take it. They gave it to him, but he hadn't taken it yet. Did you know you can go right down the road? Uh, Andrew Wirtz right here. He was working in the ministry and we had a guy that tried to destroy my ministry, called partners and told them that I was of the devil and 
that Isaac called and other things. And Andrew was under him and was hearing all of these negative things. But then Jamie just felt really impressed to bring Andrew Wirtz into our executive team. And when Andrew came in and got to sitting on our executive team, he found out that what he was hearing about us wasn't right. And so over in England during one of our meetings, he went and talked to Billy and uh, who else was it? Mike and Kerry. And he put his job on the line. He'd been with us at that time, I don't know, 15, 16 years, or I don't know. Anyway, he'd been with us a long time. And he put his job on the line and blew the whistle on this guy. And if we didn't accept it, that would have been the end of Andrew and Jeremy. And yet, did you know he put the ministry ahead of himself? And today he's the chief operation officer, is that correct? Just changed his title. And you can go right down the row. And you, you know our praise and worship right here is led by Chandler. Well, first of all, Daniel is the one that did our praise and worship. But then he felt like God was moving him more into the Healing Now ministry. And he raised Chandra up to run our praise and worship. And you may not have noticed, but Chandra was over on the side tonight, just playing the guitar in the background. And she led other people. Or no, that was this morning. Excuse me, tonight she was up here. But this morning, she let Daniel leave. This is the way it is. And we've had people that have been in other places, other Bible schools, and they say one of the things that's different is nobody is here to build their kingdom. Nobody is here competing with the other instructors to see who can be the best instructor. And did you know when you get that kind of an attitude, that allows the power of God to flow through humility. God resists pride, but he gives grace unto the humble. Grace is God's unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor. It's everything that God is available to us on an unearned basis. And man, when you humble yourself, you just get the supernatural power of God flowing towards you. So tonight, I, I want to just play off of this To Die's Game musical that we saw and encourage you that you know what? You need to get beyond yourself. You need to take your attention off of yourself. That's not to say that you're going to refuse a healing, that you aren't still believing and, and receiving and taking the truths, but you are going to glorify God and you're going to go to worshiping God and start praising God because he's worthy to be praised whether you've seen it in your body or not. Amen. And I tell you, when you start praising God, I believe that it is strength to still the enemy and the avengers, what it says in Psalms chapter 8. When you start praising God like that, Satan is an ego, an egotist. He is totally focused on himself. He has always wanted the worship that goes towards God. And when you start glorifying God, Satan can't stand it. Demons will flee. There's scriptural examples of that. And when you truly start praising God, not because you're just parroting what somebody else has done, but you truly are loving God more than you love yourself, and you're going to praise God whether you have seen a healing in yourself or not. You're going to glorify God. When you start doing that with a pure heart, man, it will just transform you. And I can promise you this, you'll never outgive God. If you give God the praise and the worship and you start praising Him, God will never let you outgive Him. When you start operating in faith towards Him and glorifying Him, I guarantee you God's going to bless you back you'll be more blessed than you'll ever bless him. So I just want to encourage you with this tonight. This may not sound encouraging, but it is <laughs> encouraging. It's actually wonderful to just come to the end of yourself and get to a place to where God, if you can't defend me, if you can't take care of this, I'm certainly not going to try and do it myself. Vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord, I will repay. Cast all of your care over on the Lord because he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Amen? Amen. Praise God. I want to encourage our praise and worship, our, um, what do you call them, prayer ministers. I want to encourage our prayer ministers to come down here. And man, if I hit a nerve tonight, you need to respond. Really, everybody needs to respond to this. Nobody is perfect in this area. But you, some people haven't even thought that this is a good thing. It's, this is a new wrinkle in your brain to think that there, you could think about somebody besides yourself. 
You could praise God even before you have what you need. You could praise God just because God is good and you're going to praise Him for who He is. If this is new to you and you haven't responded to that, you could come down here and just agree with somebody and just say, you know, that I want to humble myself. You have to humble yourself. Amen? Praise God. Amen. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Become a living sacrifice. And the problem with a living sacrifice is it keeps crawling off the altar. It's not a one-time decision. You start it one time, but then you have to live it every single day of your life. And I, I tell you, it's really awesome when you get to where you don't have to defend yourself. You, the burden isn't on you. It's, the burden's not on you to get healed. Man, you are just going to glorify God and you're going to start worshiping Him. It's actually a great way to live. You know, during COVID, we had all of our city leaders, the, the, the commissioners and the health department sit right down here and we were all in this auditorium and they were just ragging on me and saying things about how terrible we were. And I remember this one commissioner got up and said, you have no integrity. You are a, I forgot the exact words, but I remember no integrity. And he just blasted me and he really expected me to respond. And you know how I responded? I told him, I said, look, I've been criticized by people a lot more important than you. <laughs> I don't think it blessed him, but it really blessed me. You weren't a part of that, were you? That was before. Robert was a city councilman here, but that was before his days. But I tell you, you just come to the end of yourself. It doesn't matter what people say about you. I had a guy come up one time and say, you were wrong on this. And he just started criticizing me and saying all these things. And I just stopped him in the middle. And I said, who died and made you God? And he looked at me like, well, what are you saying? I said, you aren't God. I don't have to please you. Well, he got offended and I said, I don't care what you think. And he says, well, you should. And I said, I don't. <laughs> I said, you're nobody compared to God. And I said, the only person I am totally dependent upon is God. And as long as I feel like I'm doing what God tells me to do, I don't care what somebody else thinks. Did you know the only people that will ever let you down are the ones that you lean upon? You don't lean on anything except the everlasting arms and you'll never get let down. Amen. So again, everybody could say, man, I needed this. And, you know, I need to remember that there's only one God and I am not him. And you need to get beyond yourself. Everybody needs this to a degree. But I know that God is speaking to some people that you've been so consumed with your situation, so focused on yourself that you haven't realized it, but you've been just totally in pride. You've been self-centered. And God spoke to you tonight and you've never dealt with this. And so you need to repent. Again, all of us could receive to some degree, but I'm talking to the people that this has been a major problem. God spoke to you tonight and you need to humble yourself. If that's you, I want you to stand up right where you are. And we're going to pray with you right now. And somebody's saying, can't you have everybody close their eyes so that we... <laughs> no, you're humbling yourself. I want everybody's eyes open, your head up so that you get the maximum humiliation out of it. <laughs> Father, we just thank you. Thank you, Father, for what Jesus has done for us. Thank you for all of these people that have sacrificed their life and everything that they are for our sake. Thank you for people that put your kingdom ahead of their own personal gain and that we're benefiting from it today. Thank you for those who have died for translating the scriptures, John Hush and Wycliffe and Luther and so many others, Tyndale. Thank you for people that were burned at the stake and Father, we just want to put you ahead of ourselves. 
And even though we desire to be healed and we know it's your will for us to be healed, we're going to praise you even before we see it. We are going to glorify you for who you are. Father, we're going to minister to somebody else before we receive. We're taking our attention off of ourselves and putting it upon you. And these people have stood, they've humbled themselves. You said that if we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, that you will exalt us. And so we are humbling ourselves right here, standing in front of our brothers and sisters. We're crawling up on the altar and becoming a living sacrifice. And we ask for the fire of God to consume these sacrifices. Father, to take our attention away from ourselves, to help us to get beyond just our needs and help us to focus on you and on other people. And so, Father, we've humbled ourselves and we believe that that's happening, that you are doing these things inside in our emotions. And we believe that as we humble ourselves, we just thank you that your power is going to flow through humility, that your anointing will flow, that healings will happen, that people will be set free. And so, Father, we thank you for that. We agree and we receive that in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.